I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, and first order of business today, we'll just um, make a motion to approve our minutes from last time. Um, do I hear a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. So uh, first off, I just want to let you know, I just sent, because um, I just received um, the proposal for sampling, which we'll be talking about, um, hopefully with David. Um, I just sent that to everyone. Um, so it'll be in your inbox. All right. And uh, so first thing, uh, update about the farmer's market uh, proposal. Um, I attended the uh, last select board meeting uh, with Chuck, uh, was present, and we uh, talked about uh, hiring a coordinator. Um, hey, David. Oh. Um, talked about hiring Hello. a coordinator. Hello, <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Of course. Um, well, we got one update about farmers markets and then we'll, we'll let you take over. So um, speaking for the select board, um, they were very in, much in favor of uh, putting some money aside to hire a coordinator. Um, I just have to talk to Michael about the job description um, to get something out there. Um, but um, we were looking at doing 5,000 this year for the rest of this fiscal season. And then we'll probably have to do another 5,000 after um, uh, for the next season. Oh, and Michael's here too. Oh, good. Um, so that being said, um, uh, anecdotally asking around um, about other farmers markets, um, it seems uh, just like a lot of places, there's a lot of turnover right now in managers. Um, so, um, some of the more established markets from what I heard, Michael, um, it was about a $20 pay rate, uh, for a co coordinator. So, um, if I did my math correctly, if we were doing like a 12 week market, um, say 20 hours a week, um, that'd roughly be about five grand, um, now that doesn't include the winter time, um, obviously. Um, but I think that is where, um, if we can attract a coordinator, our committee might be helpful in the winter time doing some of the outreach and promotion and stuff like that to offset. Because from what I've heard anecdotally that it's, it's a lot of work and I feel like a lot of people weren't getting enough support or didn't have enough support in their farmers markets whether they, because they were a volunteer um, or there was no real board or any, uh, anyone else behind them. Um, just open up any other thoughts. So, I, I mean, I'd be happy to help. Yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Um, did we talk about whether the market would accept, what are the, what are the- Snap, snap? WIC. Well, I think that's something we'd, we, we would have hopefully be responsible as a board to probably take on okay. figuring that whole system out um, to make it easier because I think a lot of people put it on to the um, uh, coordinator, um, but it is a lot of, I think, a lot of work to get established. Um, I'd also think that someone on the board might be like a liaison mm -hmm. to help kind of facilitate when they need help or something like that. So they're not necessarily here um, every every meeting, mm -hmm. unless they need to be, and especially in the beginning. The the math uh, that you just worked out, um, how much, how much planning time, uh, uh, you know, off season, do coordinators typically have to spend to line things up? You know, do all the everything needs to be to happen to make it you know to make the season run. Mm -hmm. I think, well, because we're getting started, it's going to be a little bit more than, say, your average season that just rolls right into the next. Um, so 
I think that's in my head, I'm thinking $20 an hour is the pay rate. It's going to be, I don't know about this, Michael, stipend, um, however it's proportioned. Um, and the, commi uh, the commission would be really stepping up this winter to help get it, get it going, to offset the hours that they, they, they might be putting in, um, exceeding that um, 20 hours a week kind of idea that I had in my head. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And where where are you advertising? Or where are you looking? Well, I think that's what me and Michael, we got to coordinate and, and get the description settled so we can start right. putting it out. Okay. I was going to say, if we if we make some assumptions, like say 250 hours, $20 mm -hmm. an hour, the um, person would just maybe, you know, would almost have to work independently. I mean, mm -hmm. just keep a journal of the work that they do. I could see this board being as a board they report to and put that mm -hmm. right in the job description. So that mm -hmm. every month they come in during the off season when well, we're yeah. getting it up and running. Um, so it'd be the time at those board meetings, then their other time, and then just plan it out that way. And then, yeah, just come up with the job description and what the expectations are and sort of a timeline for trying to get this off the ground would be the... Mm -hmm. I'm going to check to see if, because uh, we had a farmer's record in North Adams, I might have in some of my old files, maybe uh, uh, electronic files, maybe a job description of the farmer's market coordinator, because we I didn't mean, have one. Yeah, that would be, if, if you send that, and then maybe me and you, Michael, can just get it squared away, um, if that sounds good with everyone, um, sure. and then just get it out there as soon as possible. Um, because it does sound like there is some turnover right now in some markets um, as the season comes to an end. Anything else about farmers markets? I think that was the biggest thing, um, conclusion that we had from the select board meeting. Did we pick a day and time? I don't remember. Did we pick a day and time or was that to be determined? For? For the market to happen? No, I think that's something that coordinated, yeah. That, you know, it was very much more just get the select board support, get the, the ball rolling for a coordinator, and then we can hash out that stuff over the winter time. I think what I would like to do is have a very specific farmer's market meeting here. Um, once uh, we get some farmers, reach out to some farmers and have them really invite and get at a very focused meeting about it. Um, and maybe a coordinator's there um, or not. Okay. All right. Um, I know I said our next thing um, on the agenda is uh, our philosophy. If it's okay with everyone, since we have guests, um, we'll just, we'll, we'll change over and give David some time. Um, so um, I, was re I was on email chain um, and um, with Bob um, Leverett and talking about uh, soil sampling in Ice Glen. Um, and uh, I just asked David to come um, and do us the courtesy of letting us know what was happening just so we can we can stay in tune with it and make sure that we are uh, supporting in any way as the, the forestry uh, commission on the forestry side of it. Um, and they showed up. So we, we thank you very much for showing up uh, and talking with us. And uh, I just shared with everyone uh, the proposal and I will will hand it off to you. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, nice being here and thank you very much for for kind of listening and attending our requests for working at Iceland. So I'm just going to give you a well I'm going to introduce you to Stefania. Hello. So we are a group of ecologists at, at Harvard University and we basically work on trying to understand uh, forest recovery in different places. And one of the places is all the New England, basically, which as probably you know, the history of New England is quite unique in the sense that it was heavily deforested for centuries, for, for a little over a century, well, almost two centuries, and then it's been recovering. So uh, there are a few places actually on the earth where you can actually find this kind of recovery at the scale that is happening here in New England. And so what we do in, in the different places where we study this kind of process is basically we go to the place and we get samples of different things that we found, find important. And in particular in Ice Glen and other places that are recovering, 
well, sorry, the thing is we're studying ecosystem forest recovery and then we compare them with all growth uh, forests. That's why Ice Glen is in the, in the study and a few other places in Massachusetts. And so what we get in this forest is basically we try to understand how forests recover more or less their complexity. Instead of just looking at trees, tree species or plant species or bird species, we try to have a look at something more kind of comprehensive. And we look specifically at the interactions between trees and soil microbes, specifically fungi and bacteria. So to, to, to address this, what we do is basically we go to the field, we get root samples and we sequence those root samples for the DNA that fungi and bacteria can, you know, that can happen in, that in, in the roots of the trees. And then with that, we build interaction networks between the trees and the soil microbes. For instance, let's say one hemlock is sequenced in different roots, in different parts of the roots, and then you find maybe like 15 species of fungi and 10 species of, of bacteria. That would be like kind of a tiny network between one tree and microbes. And then we repeat that for different species of trees uh, across the forests. And then what we are hoping to find is how these forests recover and and well, more it would be like how far they are from the old growth, let's say counterparts on the on the on the study. So and that's why we need preferences. We have Ice Glen in in the in the study. We have selected also uh, Brian Homestead that probably know in coming coming. What are we talking about? Coming, coming? Coming yes, coming to that's right. And then we have we're coming today from Monroe State Forest here in Monroe. And because there is like the three only, let's say more or less flat, old growth forests that you can find in Massachusetts, pretty much. We have found a lot of old growth forests, but it's all quite steep. Most of the old growth forests we have found so far is actually a little bit not old growth forests. It's a little bit kind of intervened in some way, like selectively logged, something like that. So these are the only three places where we think there has been or either no or very little logging. According to Bob Leverett, who is our, our kind of consultant in old growth, because we really don't know anything about uh, old growth in, in, in Western Massachusetts or New England in general, we are learning a lot. And so the goal of this study is to go to the forest and take samples a few times over the next, let's say, while well, we're, uh, this is the second time that we would like to go. And then, uh, hopefully repeat it next year, but they will be depending on funding and so on. So, and what we do in the forest is basically getting a few root samples from in Ice Glen, we are selecting, we are choosing, we are, sorry, sampling hemlocks. And what is the other one? Like, oh, red oaks. Uh, yes, those two. So in total, we select that. We just would sample six species, I mean, six individuals. And then we also core the trees to know the age of the trees because we're gonna see what is the effect of the age. So maybe we hypothesize that the older the trees they get, the more complex will be the interaction with the soil microbes. And, and that's that's basically all we get. So there is only this, uh, we core the trees. When we do get, when you core the trees, you basically get that like a tiny core, which is five millimeters in diameter to drill it. And then you drill it with a slope, like kind of going upward, so water does not accumulate, so it prevents a kind of rotting and all kind of problems of kind of material debris that can get into the hole. So that's kind of how you keep the tree safe for for preventing kind of um, any kind of disease that can get into the wood. And um, and we are also in in Iceland, we are also sampling white ash. I forgot that. So we have nine trees total, because there are amazing white ash specimens that kind of quite unique, so that could be also helpful to understand the, the process. And that is basically an overview of the kind of research that we do and what we be getting in, in, in the forest. And what I was talking with Matthew and Kate is that we will be very happy to share any results from with all of you. Also, uh, the, only, the only thing I would need to tell you is that results take a long time to come up because we need to, need to do through a whole s uh, process of sampling, all the sequencing of the DNA that takes months and months, and then we need to do the analysis. So this just takes a long time. But anyways, we'll be very happy to share any result that we get with you, hopefully within the next, I don't know, one year or something like that. This is where we would expect at least to have everything like kind of finished in that sense because we are sampling 
we have three other growth forests plus I think we have nine other locations, which is secondary growth all, all, all around central western Massachusetts and southern New Hampshire. Yeah, I think that's it's nine, nine sites. And we repeat the same thing in all of them. So it's exactly the same kind of process. We get roots, we core the trees, and we are now adding another kind of uh, sampling, which is leaves. We are collecting leaves because one another scientist from the UK that kind of learned about our chrono sequence, which is how you call it when you are sequencing forests that have been degraded at different times in history. And she was interested in getting leaves from kind of these secondary growth forests and old growth forests. So we sequence, sequence, we would sequence the leaves to see what are the insects that are eating those leaves. So it builds a little bit more on the complexity idea of, of the forest. <clears throat> uh, well, before I have, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. I would actually, you have questions, <laughs> basically. Just can you repeat the what the underlying hypothesis, what it is here? Oh, the underlying hypothesis is uh, that, well, the first, the assumption is that as you forests are degraded, for instance, what uh, Europeans did when they came here and they logged all yeah. the forests and they transformed that into grasslands, you are basically reducing the interactions between plants and soil microbes, and that yeah. makes forests more vulnerable. Okay. So Thanks. our hypothesis is that as they recover, we hypothesize that they recover that complexity and that would increase the resilience of the forests. And that's why we need all growth forests less, less like Ice Glen to see, to say like a, like a, that would be like the benchmark, benchmark kind of resiliency that we could use to compare with the secondary growth forests. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So has any work been done in terms of taking them, like taking the soil microbes from Ice Glen, putting them in the and has any work oh, from, been from done? other studies? No, I don't. I haven't seen any other study before that has looked at that. The only know the only person I know has has work at Iceland is Bob when he was collecting some of the cores from the trees. That's no, my, the only question, work. my question was: Has any work been done about like taking them, taking the microbes from one forest and putting them in another to see oh. to see if they, you know, if they can be helpful in another place? Just a thought. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, uh, that's the idea eventually of the study. So hopefully yeah. we're going to be able to find out with which microbes are uh, more beneficial or like are more related to forests that are older. And so in theory, those are the microbes that we would want to have in forests that have been recently disturbed or that are generating more slowly. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's why you call inocula. So you would try to transfer those microbes eventually to see what's the impact on forests. And so as far as we know, I don't think that I've seen any studies uh, around this area on that. Um, but there are a couple of restoration um, studies elsewhere in the world that have tried to do that uh, with, with some degree of success. But uh, one of the main pitfalls of those studies is that generally they don't exactly know which are the microbes. And so that's the, the sure. difference in our studies that we're trying to sequence all of these microbes to actually be able to say who they are um, mm -hmm. and know uh, the composition of those uh, microbial communities, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, there is, there is actually a few studies that have been looking at kind of, as, as Stefania was saying, like, like general inoculas, like getting soil from one forest and putting yes. somewhere else, just yes. planting soil. And it seems it works, but we're going to have something more targeted than that. Mm -hmm. So we, you can actually design a restoration tool so the, the goal actually, as Stephanie was saying, is of designing a tool that we can actually tell this is the kind of soy microbes that you need in this kind of forest to accelerate recovery. Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. I hope so. I hope, <laughs> I, hope, I hope funders like it too. <laughs> I mean, um, Massachusetts is probably like one with the start, right? But ideally, I mean, if there's more funding and like, of course, in a very long, longer time you want to try to replicate this in other ecosystems as well just mm -hmm. to know you know we have this type of forest these are the microbes that are good so like can we like transplant these microbes to this uh, regenerating site uh, yep. to make it um, you know regenerate faster and so in terms of restoration that has several implications because restoration is generally um, expensive if you're planting a lot of trees right. and so in theory this would allow uh, for I guess semi-natural regeneration because we're still altering the soil by inoculating it um, 
but it could be in theory significantly cheaper if it if there's a way to produce those inocula in a relatively easy way. Mm. And the idea is that in some way, it also would it's not you are restoring the trees, you're restoring the soil, which is the right. key component so, of restoration, which is something that is commonly overlooked when yes. you're looking in grassland and forest restoration. And it's so important. And 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 I think this is not must this is something that we hope in the future is kind of widely used, but for now it's kind of only a very occasionally used. Yeah, so I know there is people working in, in a very sim with a very similar approach in grasslands in the University of, let me see, was Kansas or Tennessee? Anyways, I think it was Kansas. And they have this similar approach of trying to look at what are the species of fungi that are in the soil that are associated with the grass species, and then try to see what are the right combinations to, to accelerate the recovery process. The problem about Kansas, I mean, basically the the grasslands is that they are so heavily loaded with nitrogen and phosphorus that it makes very difficult to have species composition that are similar to the original grasslands, which were so depleted in phosphorus specifically that species are just different. And I think in the case of New England, where where you don't have you haven't you don't have that agricultural legacy for 200 years, it's a much let's say milder impact. You don't have that problem. You do soil analysis, which is something that we will do too of nitrogen and phosphorus. You see that the, the baseline is not very different from old growth, although still you can find some places with you can kind of it's like a you can find like a legacy of nitrogen that can dates back for 150 years, something like that. It's less common, let's say. Hmm. Wait, would you repeat again um, the species you're going to be sampling? Yes. So in Iceland, we have. We basically follow the same schedule in every in every forest. We go to the forest, we kind of visually understand where the dominant species, and we sequence those species that are expected to cover, let's say, around 90% of the forest cover. And in Iceland, those species are uh, mostly hemlock, which covers most of the of the of the area, and then red oaks in a, at a much lesser degree, and an even a much lesser degree is white ash. So it's it's heavily dominated by hemlocks and then we have white pines, but white pines are kind of a little farther away. So we weren't sure that would be considered all growth. So we decided to not to, to sample the white pines part based on our understanding of what that would uh, an all growth forest would be. Well, it's definitely came around at, at, at an exciting time. As we could tell, we are developing our, our philosophy around forest as, as a new commission. So, uh, is hopefully in years to come, we are trying to uh, develop more old growth uh, out of the public forests we do have now currently uh, and transition them through the secessions to, to hopefully becoming old growth one day in 400 years. <laughs> um, but uh, what I guess one question I had was what um, what have you been noticing in the forest transitions, especially in terms of climate change, uh, anecdotally speaking, as you're walking around the forest that you're sampling, uh, what trees are you seeing? Uh, what, I guess, what, what are the forests, how are they responding? Well, that, that's something I would really like to know. <laughs> that's something that requires a whole research project because- You I only mean, got five of... minutes, not just <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I haven't been able to identify yet. I mean, we, I would say that we are still in a learning process. We, I mean, I moved to New England three years ago, uh, and I, I, one of the key things when I moved here was like, I really want to learn about how this amazing recovery process that has happened all around New England, and I'm basically learning about it. How is that affected by climate change is something that uh, nobody knows so far. I know people in the Harvard Forest, who live from the Harvard Forest have been working on trying to understand this, and they've been doing a lot of work in, for instance, carbon sequestration with these huge sensors that they have there. I don't know if you've been there. It's really amazing, and say so they are seeing, for instance, carbon is keeps accumulating, accumulating, and it's it's still been, let's say, the amount of carbon that accumulates is being kind of quite stable, increasingly in a stable state for since it was abandoned, and it's not decreasing yet. Which is a sign, uh, sign for us that the forest is not recovered. It's basically on the process, which is uh, clearly on the way to recovery, but it's not recovered. And but how climate change is going to affect that? I have no clue. And if you follow the patterns of, of, of 
I mean, the, the fact that is happening in other places, you would see there's going to be changes in the species composition. And those changes will be more clear if you are at the edge of the distributional ranges of the species you are looking at, or when you have a kind of large biome. So you would see, I, I don't know, for instance, you would see an increase in more southern species. For instance, if you are talking about the the Iceland, you would see probably what you would see an increase in maybe oaks in over over time and. Uh, definitely, and we have the additional complexity of invasive species like the emerald ash border, which is killing, which is killing all the white ash. So the amazing white ashes that you find in the Iceland will be gone probably in the next few years. And that's that's in addition to climate change. So that's yeah. a, that's a big problem. Also, you have the adelgid that is are killing the hemlocks. So you can see probably a stronger effect from human introduced invasive species than from climate change, because it depends on the severity of, for instance, um, um, the woolly adelgid, uh, the severity of the attack of the adelgid, they can completely kill all the amazing hemlocks that you guys have in Iceland. I don't, I know, I, I think Kate, me, Kate told me that you may be treating the hemlocks in some way to avoid their, that they disappear. Is that, so, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we are currently in the process of, of treating uh, the trees. Um, we started in the fall and then, or excuse me, in the spring, and we continue in, this, in the fall because since it is the way it is, it's very hard to access quickly and, and get material up to the site. So uh, it took a lot longer and the trees are also, the uptake of the treatment wasn't, wasn't as quick. So, um, we haven't got the official number for this year yet of how many trees we, we treated, um, but it was all the hemlocks or it was predominantly hemlock and uh, we did a few ash for ash borer. Oh, you also treated for white ash, okay, for the yeah. emerald border, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So I hope that okay. doesn't affect, affect you <laughs> in any way. No, I mean, it would affect if you, because as I assume you are using some kind of pesticide that would kill insects in general so mm -hmm. it would affect the leaf sampling in the sense that if we sample leaves that have been treated it wouldn't represent the natural uh, insects that are not invasive that are the ones that you would expect to find mm -hmm. uh, but that's fine i mean that's not a big problem for us i mean this it won't affect at all i think the soil microbial community that's that's that mean that we have a problem and that's what that's our main focus right now and but knowing that you guys have treated both trees uh, ash and hemlocks we probably won't take any samples from those trees because it would be basically biased in, in because all the insects would be probably gone. Um, may, may I ask um, what is the treatment or how do you apply? Is it like a spray thing or is it more locally uh, applied to the trees? Uh, so what we did uh, originally had planned for injection um, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name Dion right now. Tefron. Dion Tefron. Um, was predominantly injection. Uh, it was uh, recommended to us because of the severity of our woolly adelgid outbreak, um, which they are very present right now in the Glen. Um, so it was predominantly injection, um, but in the fall, we switched to partially uh, basal spray um, because we because we weren't able to, um, the trees weren't taking up the treatment as quickly. So we weren't able to treat as many trees as we had uh, put out for. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, this fall, we will get hopefully a summary of how we did because between when we discovered it and when we actually got to treatment, I think okay. uh, Ken said there was about 30 trees that died. Wow. Um, and that was about, a, I want to say a year and a half or a year. About a year ago. It was about a year once we identified it, about 286 trees were in very poor condition. Um, and since that time, 30 of those in the very, very poor condition um, have died. And uh, that was out of, I think, 300 something he had done. Most of them were in poor condition. There was only a few that were fair and one that was he considered um, in good condition. Um, 
So that's something that why this commission was kind of put together was to start working on and figuring out uh, what to do for the Glen um, as it's going through this transition. And since we are, uh, the boundary line for the Woolly Adelges keeps going further and further north, uh, the winters used to kill them pretty good here um, and used to keep them at bay when there was an outbreak. Um, and now more and more of them are surviving and these trees are uh, not fighting them off as quickly as they were, were once able to. Um, I think I summed that up pretty, is there anything else okay. I forgot? Um, would you mind um, spelling the first chemical that you uh, mentioned? I, I, I heard Diane Teffron, but I don't know how that's spelled. So it would help us just to like know exactly what it is maybe in case we need it. Oh, no problem. Let me go we to could my- just type it in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Yes, that, that'll be great. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> so, okay. Would it help if we sent them Ken's report? Oh yeah, we do have a report we could send you with some maps and what the findings were and actually okay. have. Yes, that'd be great. That'd be great. And does that the, the report it also includes the R treatment? Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful. And it identifies all the trees and where they are uh, located. Okay. Um, so I will I will email that to you because it is in my files. Right. That would have the chemicals. And it has all the chem and the recommended treatment and dosage and everything. And then that treatment is, this is just out of curiosity. So that treatment has to be applied every year or twice a year or? Every two years. Every two, two, years. two years, like forever, basically. Yeah. If, if we go that route, uh, I think uh, that is something we, uh, why we're here to kind of figure out what, what is the process? We're, we're hoping, we're hoping for a different treatment in yeah. the future. Okay. Yeah. I, no, I agree, but the thing is that if, I mean, I'm thinking just long-term as usual. So do you think about uh, saving the trees on a kind of long-term basis? You will need to apply this until the kind of the pest has kind of, yeah. kind of finished up with all the other trees that, all the other trees around that are actually helping connect with trees with another one that is actually helping the spread of the disease. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking that how long that would it take I don't know. The wool adult is quite quick killing things, unfortunately. So we need to be applying that for a few decades. Mm -hmm. And then when there's no more trees to kill, the wool adult will basically disappear. Hopefully. Hopefully yeah. <laughs> so are you treating all trees or it's, only the trees that are sick? Um, right now, I believe we are treating only the ones that are, are in, considered in poor condition. Um, we following the, the rules of the label, the pesticide, since we, it is such a small um, acreage, we can't dump <laughs> enough pesticide to yeah. treat every tree because it would be too toxic for, yeah. for the acreage. So basically uh, we, are, we are focusing on the ones that are in the poorest condition. Um, mm -hmm. But like you said, it is a situation like the uh, American chestnut, where uh, I feel like there was a mania uh, that went about, <laughs> everyone chopped them down as quickly as they could to make what they could out of it um, and potentially chopped down trees that were resistant. resistant and we don't know because they didn't mm -hmm. give them a chance. So in what some things that we've discussed, it's more of prolonging the life to allow more um, generations to be produced and hopefully in that time, there will be a uh, uh, something that is a little bit more uh, resistant to the woolly adelgid um, over time. But it, it was a triage kind of scenario where we found out very rapidly how bad it was uh, and how mm -hmm. quick they were going down. No, I think it's great. I mean, it's it's even if it's a drastic solution, I would do it. I mean, yeah. the, the hemlocks at Iceland are kind of quite unique. So it's not like most of the secondary growth hemlock that are 20, 30, 50 years old. Right. This is kind of a different thing. So I, I, even if it's a little not the best option, I would definitely do it because there is no way back. So once they are dead, they're dead they will be dead forever. Mm -hmm. And that will be back. So we're hoping that-, that A good idea. And, and, and hopefully at some point, if we just keep them alive long enough, we, they'll, that something will 
turn up that will be a more biological control or, I or really integ hope integrated so. pest management because obviously people are looking into this. Yeah, I know, I know. I know people in the Harvard Ford is looking into this and many other people. So I, I really hope there is something that comes up soon with this and the many other things we are messing up with in the New England forests. So for that matter, if, if you, in, in the course of your work, if you run into anything that looks like it has any kind of promise as far as IPM or biological control, uh, let us know. Of course, of course, yes. Well, I can tell that I am not super expert on this kind of uh, biological um, control approaches, but I definitely will, will let you know. Because we're really working in New England forests and we really talk with a lot of people that is having yeah. this. Good. Any more questions? And two, if things arise, if you want more information um, after I send you the report, please, you can reach out to me and I can share with the commission. Um, do you know roughly when uh, in the next couple of weeks you'll be around? Uh, we'll be actually going this week, hopefully. If that is okay with you guys, we'll be like, so we are actually now, some, we went today to sample in Monroe. Tomorrow we'll be working in, well, it depends on, the schedule, it depends on how long it's gonna take every other places, but it will be either this week or next week. We're going tomorrow to Hopkins Forest here in Williamstown, where we are staying today. And then next, this will be either Iceland or uh, Brian Homestead. Uh, so we, with something between this, this week or next week. But still to be determined, it depends because every day things are a little different that we don't know exactly the day that we'll be going to Iceland. We need to just follow the sequence of forests that we are sampling these days. I can tell you exactly when we figure out that probably tomorrow we'll decide if we go to Iceland or we go to Brian the next day, depending on the schedule. And if we go to either or the other one, then the other one would be the next week, hopefully Monday yeah, or yeah. Tuesday. Perfect. Good. Yeah, if just, you want to join us, you'll be very welcome to come. <laughs> I, well, I didn't want to impose on you, but if, if, if anyone's around, I'll let, I'll let everyone know um, just so we can, you know, sure, we're literally sitting, sitting right next to Iceland as we speak out the back of this window. So I'm sure someone oh, might. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you are back. in the house on the right as you go to Iceland. Oh. Not that close. Not that, not that, not that, not oh, that. Okay. We're, we're, we're in the giant uh, old school right now. Ah, okay, but. okay, okay. That was it. Looking <laughs> at the window, I think it was like really in that house. Okay. That's a beautiful house, by the way. <laughs> uh, that being said, th thank you so much for doing us this courtesy and speaking to us. And I hope... Uh, of I hope we can stay in touch more as things develop and uh, we could hopefully... Um, Keep you keep you as good counsel in the future. Yes, of course. Yes, we'll do whatever we can. It's in our kind of knowledge, which is always limited, and we'll share with you whatever we come up with within the next month's year. That I hope we get some kind of relevant results. We'll see. That's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. It was really nice to meet you. All. Nice to meet you. Too. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Uh, okay. Very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, it's great. I'm I'm very excited that came up, um, and I uh, assumed it wasn't. I didn't know we had you had brought it up before from Bob's side. Bob, you know, he said something about sampling. I think this is what he was. This is what he's talking he, about. He was intending. It's one of many. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure he's got a lot of ideas. Um, um, but I hope, you know, uh, that's why, you know, that was kind of thrown into our laps, but that is kind of the discussion I hope to bring here, uh, more often when people, uh, answer my emails, but <laughs> so, um, I'm going to send that, uh, report to them before I, uh, forget, but that leads us, um, right into, uh, kind of just broaching our philosophy and talking about, um, and I thought that worked very, very good as a segue, um, kind of figure out where we're going uh, on the forestry side, at least um, 
with with uh, public forests. And I think they brought up a good point that uh, it's not just about the trees. Uh, it's also about the soil. It's about the animals. It's about the fungi, the whole the whole system. Um, so just kind of, you know, I put it back on here because I knew that might spark uh, some more discussion um, and what people think about um, the way the town forests should be managed um, in the future and for the future. Well, I thought about this a little bit. I didn't come up with the philosophy, but I mean, our role is advisory. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, we can you know, be advisory to the select board about management of the town forests. Um, but it is advisory. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 the words that came to my mind were preservation, conservation, maintenance, care, um, you know, simple. Mm -hmm. But to keep something in there, uh, um, to include what we've talked about a couple of times of trying to designate one section of town for us to really just be let B. Mm -hmm. So to, if I, I think our philosophy should have a range in it. Mm -hmm. You know, we certainly wouldn't want everything left alone. Um, some of it you know, managed in different ways, but to, to have a, a, a range in our philosophy to cover a lot of different possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it should be simple, a simple statement because mm -hmm. we are, we are advisory. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. And I think um, I would, I would like to see if we can advise on, on a more specific level as well uh, in terms of certain parcels, uh, certain part properties. I mean, we've got, there are only a few properties, town, town, pro, town owned properties that, um, that really have any meaningful relationship to potential growth. Um, Aside from Ice Glen, obviously, well, there's the Stockbridge Mountain chunk, which is about 300 acres altogether. Mm -hmm. There's the all of the watershed properties around um, Everk Lake, uh, and possibly Gould Meadow, but I don't know if it has enough forest on it. Um, and I think Gould Meadow is is um, under conservation commission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and they are not going to, Conservation Commission isn't doing any active mm -hmm. logging. Right. They're just right. Gonna, they would just let that be. And, and the watershed, I, I, you know, I, I think Eric made a good point that that's best left mm -hmm. um, for, well, for management. I, I actually, I, I want to, I, I, I would like us to learn more about that because from what I understand, it's, it's being quite actively managed in a way that um, I, I would like to, I would love to be able to talk to the forester who manages the watershed, um, and find out what, what his management goals are and how his management practices fit that. Because I've been doing some reading and, um, and it just, it seems that um, moving toward a more old growth forest uh, transition might actually in, improve the water quality and, uh, and, and incre increase the resilience of the soil, um, the stability of the soil, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be complete, it doesn't have to be the entire you know, many acres. Um, it could be a mixed a mixed approach. So who it, who is it that who's the manager? Who who is the forester for um, Stockbridge Mountain and the watershed? What person? Who's that person? Um, I have to go back through the notes. There was um, somebody mentioned the, the water sewer water and sewer folks have somebody they use. Mm -hmm. oh. I can uh, I can find that out for you and get it to the committee. 
okay. know we do use a forester. They've used them for years to maintain a cutting plan up there um, around the watershed. And is, so. is the same person the forester for Stockbridge Mountain? I don't know, but I will find that out. I will okay. get to that information. Because, I mean, it, it has felt like a huge gap to me since we've formed this commission that I, I haven't seen these forests. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to talk about them without, I would love to really walk it with the forester right. and see what's there. Well, I think, you know, I think that's a big part of why we, we got the, the commission to be five members so people can, we can do that without breaking quorum. And also um, from everything I've heard, I, you know, I, I think they want to walk, um, uh, when I talk to Mike, you know, about walk, talking about that property mountain um, property, because I knew it took them a couple of years before they could even sell the lot of, I think it was popular that they were, they, the land they are logging, it took them a few years to even sell it for anyone to be interested uh, in it. Um, so I don't want people to think either that a lot of these places are, you know, getting logged on a yearly by uh, um, multi, <laughs> multi times per year. It took them a while to even find anyone that was willing. Um, but I think I agree, it's, it's more, you know, like you were saying, um, since we are in an advisory role, it is, I think it's important that we have a, uh, have, have a sense of our philosophy so that um, we can recommend this stuff and come with the evidence too, like you were saying, Shelby, and say like, look, this is what we're seeing with soil health, water, purity, X, Y, Z, to, to really back ourselves up. Um, because at the end of the day, I think we, if we want to make some, or not make change, or I guess make change, or improve the, the forest health, I think we're gonna have to bring some of these people in and, and show them, especially like this sampling that we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think when we can show that, at least it is very hyper-specific to our town now, right. if they come and do the sampling, mm -hmm. we can we can hand that over as a, as a proof. Yeah. Well, to take it a step yeah. further, I would really like to invite um, Captain Zero and, and D'Amato people that did those brochures and did are doing the presentations on how to um, right. manage for old growth, have them come and look at these sites with us. Yeah. I, you know, I think they'd be willing to do that. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. under grass and uh, they can, they, they have an eye for what they'd be mm -hmm. looking for and how to manage it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I love to have, are, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to have them um, come and talk to us as well. That, that, that video, um, of the presentation was really quite, quite useful. And um, one thing that struck me is that their focus is, is not just on, um, you know, town owned or trust, you know, land trust owned. It's also on providing useful information and, and kind of guidance and suggestions to private landowners. And there's an awful lot of forest in, you know, forested land in Stockbridge that's in, in private hands. And it would be, yeah. I think, awfully good of us as a commission to say we're not only, you know, taking care of town-owned properties. We're we're here to help everybody. And so, if we can come up with not only philosophy but also just some some way to um, to advise, you know, inform and advise the landowners, um, is, is there clearly our several different approaches that can can work to move toward um, old growth or in general just basically make forests more uh, sustainable and resilient so to, to take off on that and this isn't about old growth but um, one thing that's come up at the conservation commission is that so many of the hemlocks around stockbridge bowl are infested with the adelgid so um I would like to, the, the Conservation Commission wanted to have a conversation with this commission about that. I would like to invite them to yeah. our next meeting to do that. Yeah. If you can set that up, I'll just have it on the okay. agenda. Do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's more complicated. That's many landowners. Right. Um, but we could start with the Conservation Commission. Well, I guess to your point, I think it's always been a, um, and I, uh, 
the vision I think of, of sp spreading the word about this stuff is maybe um, setting up uh, in sponsored by the commission information informational uh, meeting where we invite someone like if we want to do an informational meeting about uh, transitioning to old growth, mm -hmm. we put it out to the whole community mm -hmm. and get people to, to sign up um, so that we're not necessarily, it's not the words not coming from us. Mm -hmm. It is coming from these people who are bringing in that, you know, people are interested about it um, or with the woolly Adelgid on the lake, we'll, we'll talk to the ComCon, but um, setting up a Zoom meeting where we're just kind of on the sidelines saying we're sponsoring this, helping in the, this set up um, so people can ask their questions. Um, uh, I think if, if someone wants to take that on, like that's, the, that's just the one thing I want to maybe see more of too is, is people who are interested in a very specific thing, mm -hmm. trying to make it happen. Um, so yeah. I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to contact um, Katanzaro and D'Amato and mm -hmm. see as a first step if they would come talk to us. Right. And then go from there to see if it goes mm -hmm. bigger. And I think to, uh, to leverage that too is um, reach out to the, the forester well, ha and, and see if they would come to that meeting with us. Because I don't think any forester I, I, at this day and age, I would assume the forester hasn't not heard of transition to old growth, but maybe not. I don't know. I, I'm hoping they would have some sense it, um, uh, of it. Uh, is, Michael, if you're still there, do you know if Tom Ryan is involved in any of these properties, the DCR forester? Um, not that I'm aware of. Because um, he had, remember, he had done the presentation at MVP at the right. training and it seemed like he was pretty knowledgeable about a lot of this but i didn't know if he's involved in our forest or should be i mean he's another he's another resource mm -hmm. right and also think... one one thing i think uh i i asked this once and something i would say as you guys begin planning mm -hmm. when we do say like streets and stuff if you want to they always say the worst the worst method is going worst to first. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about how we're treating the hemlocks that are in the worst shape first. Mm -hmm. But should we be going to the worst first or should it be, you know, say you have a grading from one to five, with one being the best, five being the worst, should we be treating four and up? And, you know, I think at some point you got to make some of those, those decisions mm -hmm. because a lot of times you can spend more time, energy, and funds on the ones that are in the worst shape, while you could strengthen much more by focusing on those that are not. And I don't know if it's applicable when it comes to forestry, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of other things that we do, a lot of other work we do um, from just a construction vantage point or anything else is they recommend try to stay away from worst to first, do the preventive mm -hmm. stuff to maintain. You know, if you crack steel a road, you can get a, you can make it last for 50 years. Well, if you just fix the worst road and let the other ones go, you're going to get 25 out. So, you know, I think it's a question worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think. Jeff. No, I say that, that that's a that's a great thing to to keep in mind. Um, I think we can probably apply that thinking in, in a variety of ways. But certainly. Mm -hmm certainly to treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that, you know, uh, the other thing with uh, kind of branching out with the philosophy and off that point um, is not thinking um, yearly with the forest. You know, I think that's why the, the um, transition old growth is a nice thought process of how long it actually is gonna take to transition a forest. I think uh, we will not all be on this commission before we have <laughs> movement on that um, for any of our forests. So um, I think that's why it's also kind of as this uh, commission evolves to have that time scale of, of whatever it is, if we're looking 400, down, 400 years later, if we are setting up a new old growth forest, um, 
you know, I think one debate that you know, last time I went to a conservation uh, conference, a lot of debate was swirling about um, what do we plant tree-wise if we know in about uh, 17 years, um, you know, they, at that time, this was about five years ago. They were already talking about 2040. Um, we're going to be like the mid-Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're going to be like the mid-Atlantic, do we really try to force some of these trees to keep living here that are continually migrating north, which they've, they've shown now for quite some time, a lot of the pines are. So as we, you know, invest and replant or, you know, reforest, um, I, I'm, I'm a farmer, so starting with the soil. If the soil is healthy, whatever is going to want to live is going to seed itself and keep living, you know, um, rather than us, try, you know, eventually trying to force things. Um, I, I, I think that's mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Uh, and one thing that that's kind of central to what you're saying is um, management goals uh, maybe our management goals may be different from the goals that have been set up in years past. Um, even w whether it's for, for the watershed or anything else, um, climate resilience uh, and the ultimate, you know, the, the, the coming shift in, um, in species composition uh, you know, the, the various things that we have to want to look at in terms of long-term planning, um, just we're not there as factors to, to, um, to, you know, to build a management plan around, um, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And that's why I think it'd be really useful for us to look at the forest with a forester and with, with, with folks who, who have this, that kind of newer long-term thinking in mind. Um, I, I don't question the the skill or 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 knowledge of the forester who's been working on the watershed or or on Stockbridge Mountain. Mm -hmm. I just think that that we may we may be at a point where we, we want to say, look, you know, there's some other goals that we'd like to factor into the management plan that haven't been factors before. Right. Yep. And I, I would also be curious about how many, what the invasive situation is in these places mm -hmm. and the health. I, I, I don't know the health of right. that whole, of the ecosystems there. So right. it'd, be good, it'd be good to see all of that. So I, two, two action items I, I'm hearing from, from the group, um, if we can, um, three, if I count the conservation commit, uh, committee coming to our next meeting, um, if we could set up um, a meeting with uh, Forrester and Slash just about the old growth transitional, the see UMass. if they'd be interested. People from UMass. From UMass. Yep. Um, and another thing is um, um, setting up a walk um, through the forest, um, maybe at some point. Um, it's getting cold now and whether, you know, or maybe we said that cold. <laughs> I just want to put it. Yeah. Um, I would like to not wait till the spring. I mean, I no, think that's, we can, that's if great. we can get out there. Um, so um, maybe if I could put this on a couple of people, if, if um, Shelby, maybe, um, well, it's kind of two things, or it's kind of related. Um, we'll get the name from Michael. We'll get the name from Michael. Um, and um, maybe it'd be nice to schedule a walk first. And then once we meet and talk, we can schedule a time to, to meet with the UMass people and the forester could maybe join us for that. So don't invite them to the next meeting? Maybe, uh, not, not the UMass people. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking um, if we could maybe get the name of the forester and we could schedule a walk up and let's just say um, to the, um, which property was it? The mountain. Stockbridge Mountain. Stockbridge Mountain. Stockbridge. Just to take take a walk and look around and and kind of talk through um, some things, um, Michael. Just yep. uh, clarification on site visits. If if we were to run one of these, um, we make an agenda. 
we, we let the public know just like it yep. is a normal meeting. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we got to do that's special? So the, the only thing is that if you're going to come, if you're going to make votes and take action, mm -hmm. you should typically come back to uh, mm -hmm. set it for the next meeting. So if okay. you, the nice thing is if you schedule a site visit, you can all go, you can discuss, you can talk, but you can't make any final decisions. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're in an area which is accessible to the public. And when we say accessible, that also means from ADA compliance and the rest. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would typically recommend that you do your site visit, you go up, you take a look, but then come back and discuss it at your next meeting and then make your votes of what recommendations or actions you wish to take. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that just, that's the ideal way to do it. Um, you know, if no one else shows up for the site visit and, and you guys go up and do a site visit, technically there isn't anything to stop you from making votes then. Uh, mm -hmm. But if for some reason somebody can't join you or especially if you go on private if you ever go to private property to do something, if the homeowner doesn't want the public allowed, then no one else can come. And it, then you could still do the meet and visit, but you can't make decisions at it. But like I said, I recommend not making votes when you're on a site visit. It's better to uh, come back and then make those votes then. But you can, like I said, have discussion. You can go up and visit the site. You can do the rest. Yeah. Gotcha. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> um, perfect. Who, so who would like to reach out to the Forester? Anyone? I'll do that. Sure. That'd, be, that'd be great, Shelby. Yeah. Um, and just get a schedule and preferably, I'm assuming everyone weekend. Sunday mornings are best for me if that's- Sunday good. morning sounds great. Perfect. Um, so we'll just, we'll, we'll, as soon as you know, as long as um, I know, I need to know probably, it'd be nice to know at least the Monday before so I could put the, get the agenda in um, the couple business days of beforehand. Um, and so, so my, yeah. Michael, when you get me the um, contact information for the forester, I'll reach out to him right away. All right. I should be able to get that from Mike Papone tomorrow morning. That'd be super. And, I, and too, I, I know Mike wanted to walk it too. So I think we should invite him. Sure. I don't, I want everyone who's. Sure. More than Mary. More, more than Mary. Um, and then we'll hopefully talk and we can schedule a time yeah, to, to do the UMass with and maybe have them invited too. Yeah, this is a good first step. Um, and, and just back to the philosophy, yeah, I, yeah. I find it hard to talk about, to come up with a philosophy with half of us on Zoom and <laughs> 7.30 at night. Right. Maybe for the next meeting, if we <clears throat> came up with a draft. Right. And, and that we could share and uh, then we have something to work with. That'd be perfect. I think and hopefully if Shelby's notes are nice, um, which they always are. Um, we'll we'll be able to pull some more verbiage of kind of what we've been talking about, um, and kind of pull it pull it together. Um, it's almost like a mission statement, and I think it it's just for the philosophy or the <laughs> the forestry side of it, because I know it's kind of I think we've had a couple good discussions now. We're kind of hon honing in. Um, who who would like to take a um, preliminary go at it i'm happy to try. I'm, I'm happy to try and i'd say anyone that wants to send me some language send me send me your thoughts and i'll try to piece it together as a rough draft mm -hmm. and i'll i'll get um shelby if you can also make sure maybe just share the uh the minutes um right away with everyone just do a blank email so that way you can take some of it you can here. take take some of it great um but if you have further thoughts let me know and then oh the i guess 
totally other um, action item and for the future is, is setting up a public um, information. And I think we have a list, a, a little bit of a laundry list coming up between farmer's market, which is a, is a little bit outside of philosophy, um, but also Willie Adelgid, after we meet with the ComCom, -com, maybe they would want to do an infor informational um, meeting with the public. Or Stockbridge Bowl Association. Stockbridge Bowl Association. Um, and maybe we can get someone to, to talk, mm -hmm. talk about it um, or just have a meeting about it. Um, but I feel like I think that's the best way for us to keep interacting with the community is is have some informational um, or library display. present a library. Yeah, that maybe if it's on Zoom and at the library in person or I'm saying a library display Oh, or a display. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that would be uh, maybe thinking about the agenda. Um, if, if something really pops out to people, let's get it on the agenda. If someone has, like the UMass people, we've, we're, gonna, we're gonna get. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone has something else that they wanna see maybe, maybe uh, presented, um, I'll keep the farmer's market mm -hmm. moving um, because we'll have to have the public right. <laughs> help with that. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. I feel like we, we talked a lot tonight. Um, so next meeting, ComCom, I'll make sure that's on there. Um, that being said, not hearing anything else, um, I will make a motion to close the meeting. Uh, do I have a second? Go for it, Abby. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all in favor say aye. Hi. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.